In this session, we're going to do a quick refresher course on the topic of curve sketching, which we've broken down for you into six steps, which are six things for you to think about. So the first thing is general shape. And over the course of your studies and over the course of your future career, you're often going to come across the same functions again and again, like trig functions or natural functions, logarithms. And we think it's very important that you have a clear picture in your mind for these functions of how they're going to look. However, there are many other functions besides this that you're probably going to have no idea. So hopefully, the function that we look at today is not something that you're going to immediately think, ah, I know how that one looks. We're going to have a look at the function y equals x minus 2 divided by x squared, OK? And I expect that most of you probably don't have a picture in your mind of how this thing's going to look straight away. So the next five aspects are things that you're going to use in order to work out how this function should look on a graph. So if we just draw some axes here, OK? The first thing that we're going to look for are the intercepts. OK, so if our function looked like this, which it doesn't, OK, this point here we'd call the x-intercept and this point here the y-intercept. So clearly the x-intercept occurs when the value of y is 0, OK? So we just go to the point where y is 0. That's very easy to find from our function, we just set y to 0. So here we go, 0 equals x minus 2 divided by x squared. Now, because our function is a nice, in a nice fraction form, we can straight away look at it and say, OK, all we need to know is when our top line, our numerator, when is that 0? Because as long as this is 0, the fraction will still be 0. So we can just say x minus 2 equals 0. Solve that nice and easily. x equals 2, which gives us the coordinate for our x-axis intercept. So we now know that we've got an intercept at the point 2, comma, 0. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this bottom left-hand corner of the board, bottom right-hand corner of the board, uh, to store all the pieces of information, the useful nuggets of gold that we're going to pick up along the way. So this first one is our x-intercept. Okay, That's the only x-intercept, otherwise we'd have another value. And what it is, is at the point 2 comma 0. Okay, so we'll cordon off this region reserved for special functions, special objects. Right, so we found the x-axis intercept. What about any y-axis intercepts? So we use the same principle again. We think our y-intercepts must occur when our x value is 0 along this line here. Okay, and so we just set our x value to 0. So we can rub this out and we look for the point y equals y equals 0 minus 2 divided by 0 squared, which equals minus 2 divided by 0. Now, this operation here, this divide by 0, is what we call undefined. Okay? This, this isn't a number. We, uh, we, we can't evaluate that operation. So, that should tell us something. That gives us an indication that there's something suspicious going on. The function definitely exists both sides of the y-axis, but it doesn't have a value. It never crosses the y-axis itself. So this brings us on to our next topic, which are asymptotes. Okay, We're going to look for asymptotes, and we have just found one. So what we found here could be... Uh, one of three possible combinations of things. So what we could have is an asymptote that looks like one of these three here. So it could either be that they both go down to zero, go down to negative infinity like this, or they go one above and one below, or both above. Okay? Now, we have found a vertical asymptote, but as you'll see in the next example, you also can have vertical and at an angle asymptotes as well, diagonal asymptotes. Okay, so we need to try and work out which of these three types of asymptote that we've got in our function here. So what we do is we say, okay, we know what the function's like at zero, it's this undefined thing, but what's it like slightly ahead of zero? So what happens when x is a very, very small positive number? Okay. So what happens is this top line 
becomes a very, very small number minus 2, which is just going to be a negative number. Okay, and on the bottom line of our fraction, what happens when you've got a very, very small positive number squared? That's still just going to be a positive number. Okay, and negative divided by positive is always going to be negative again. Okay, so we know that just ahead of the y-axis, our function is negative. So it must be either one like this or one like this, because don't forget, this could equally be this way around, okay? So it could either be these two diagonals or these two. Let's think about just the other side of the y-axis. So what happens when our value of x is just ever so slightly negative? So we do the same thing again. So what's a very, very small negative number minus 2? That's still going to be a negative number. And what is a very, very small negative number squared? Well, any negative number squared is going to be a positive number. So, positive. Okay, so what we've got, once again, is negative divided by positive, which is negative again. Okay? So, this tells us that either side of our y-axis, our values of our function are going to be negative, but at the y-axis itself, we've got an asymptote. Okay? So, we must, therefore, have this type of asymptote here, where they both come up from minus infinity. Okay, so we can now put that piece of information into our little cordoned off area of useful things. So we've got an asymptote, and it looks like this. Okay, and the more technical definition of an asymptote, just to bear in mind, is when your function and a line, a straight line, the distance between them tends towards zero as they go off together infinitely far, okay? So, we've now got these two pieces of information. The next thing we're going to look for are the stationary points. So the stationary points are points in your function where the gradient equals zero. So, we can find a function for the gradient by differentiating our function up here. So, to find the first derivative, we get y dy by dx, which we can write a bit faster as y prime, equals, okay, so perhaps you don't know off the top of your head what we call the quotient rule. Perhaps you can't remember. And I hate remembering rules like this because you might just confuse yourself. So we can rewrite this function as in two parts. We can split up these two parts in the top row and say, okay, this function can be written as x over x squared minus 2 over x squared, which can again be simplified as x to the minus 1 minus 2x to the minus 2. Okay? So these three things are all exactly the same, just three different ways of writing the same thing. And now that this is split into these two parts, it's very easy to differentiate. So we just say, okay, x to the power of minus 1 differentiates to minus x to the power of minus 2. And minus 2 times x to the power of minus 2 is going to go to plus 4x to the minus 3. Okay? So this is now our differential of our function. And what we want to do is probably set this, rearrange this back into its neat fractional form if we can. So what we do here is we'd say, okay, this is minus 1 over x to the squared plus 4 over x cubed. To get the denominator the same on both these, we're going to have to multiply top and bottom just here by x. So we're going to get minus x over x cubed plus 4 over x cubed equals 4 minus x over x cubed. Okay, so we've now got our first derivative in this neat fractional form, and we use the same logic as we do for as we did for the asymptotes, where we're going to say, okay, as for the intercepts, we're going to say, okay, as a fraction, we know that if we can make this top line, the numerator, zero, then the whole thing's going to be zero. So we just have to solve the function four minus x, solve the equation four minus x equals zero. Well, that's nice and easy again. It's just x equals 4. So we know at the point x equals 4, we've got a stationary point. 
But what we have to determine now is whether our stationary point is a turning point or an inflection point, okay? Because it could be either of those two things. And let me just explain that idea with a diagram. So if I uh, rub this all out, okay, so we know that our point occurs at, our stationary point occurs at x equals four, but it could be a stationary point. You know, the, probably the classic example is a quadratic equation, which would have a stationary point maybe like this. So you can see along here, there's a zero gradient. But we could equally have a function that looks like a function that looks like this, where you can see, and I haven't drawn it brilliantly, but you can see just here the gradient's actually got flat. So there's a flat bit in your function here. Okay, that's a terrible drawing of it. Let me have another go at that. Right, if we've got some axes like this, you could have a function that looks like this, okay, with a nice flat region here. These are both stationary points, but this one is called a turning point as the function turns round, and this one's called an inflection point as the gradient of the gradients goes to zero, okay? So what, we've ha what happened here is the gradient's been getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but then it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger again, and that we call an inflection point. Right, so to work out whether our stationary point is a turning point or an inflection point, what we have to now do is find a function of the second derivative of our original function. So find the value of our second derivative at this point. So if we remember our equation for the first derivative was y equals, I'll have to cheat here, what was it again? It was the first derivative was at 4 minus x over x cubed. Okay, so we just differentiate that again and we get y double prime equals, so let's rearrange this to the form that was easier, so it's equals 4 over x cubed minus x over x cubed equals 4x to the minus 3 minus x to the minus 2. Okay, so our second derivative is going to be 4 times minus 3, so that's minus 12 x to the minus 4, and this is going to be plus 2x to the minus 3. Okay, and we can write that in its neat fractional form again, so using the same logic that we used last time, where we say, okay, uh, we can write this one as minus equals minus 12 over x to the 4 plus 2 times x over x to the 4, right? So I just multiply top and bottom by x again, and I get 2x minus 12 over x to the 4. Okay, so these three lines, these three uh, right-hand sides of the equation are all totally the same thing. They're just expressed in different ways. Okay, and now we've got it in this nice, neat fractional form. What we're trying to do once again is to find out the value of this second differential at our turning point, at our stationary point, which we found to be at x equals 4. So if we sub in 4 into our second differential formula, we get that y double dash equals 2 times 4, which is 8, minus 12 over 4 to the power of 4. So we, which is equal to, put that down here, so 8 minus 12 is minus 4 divided by 4 to the 4, which is just going to be, so y double dash is going to be minus 1 over 4 cubed, okay? So the value of our second derivative at our stationary point is minus 1 over 4 cubed. Okay, so it's a minus number. That's the only piece of information we really need to know. Is it minus, is it zero, or is it plus? Is it positive? Okay, so because it's minus, that tells us that this stationary point was in fact a turning point, 
and it was also, because it was minus, it was also a local maximum. Okay, so we know it's going to look something like it's going to have a point in it somewhere that does this, okay, and it's going to be a turning point, so TP, and that turning point is at the place X is at the coordinate, oop, blimey, is at the coordinate 4, 4, and then to find the y coordinate of our turning point, we just sub the x coordinate back into our original equation. So 4 minus 2 is 2. And divided by 16, so 4 squared is 16. So that's 2 over 16, which is 1 over 8. So it's at the point 4, 1 8, like that. So we have now found our asymptote, our x-intercept, and a turning point. The next thing we're going to look at is, are there any other places where we've got an inflection point? And inflection points occur where our second derivative is equal to zero. So anywhere where this function equals zero, and we can think about the fact that, once again, all we need to consider is our numerator. And if our numerator equals zero, then we found ourselves an inflection point. So let's say 0 equals 2x minus 12. That's all we needed to solve. When is the top line 0? And we can rearrange that very simply and say x equals, so I put the 12 over here, divided both sides by 2, x equals 6. So at the position along the x-axis equal to 6, there is an inflection point. So an inflection point means the gradient has gone from either increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Okay, we've got a local change in the gradient's change, rate of change. Okay, and we can say, right, therefore y equals 6 minus 2 divided by 6 squared equals 4 over 36 equals 2 over 18, 1 over 9. 1 over 9. Okay, is that right? Yeah. So we've also got an IP, an inflection point, at the coordinates, oops, at the coordinates 6, 1 over 9. Right. The next thing we're going to look for are, essentially, now that we've got all these pieces of information, we can draw our function, we can sketch our function, and once we've got the sketch, we can start thinking about the next two things, which are the domain and the range. Okay, so if I just rub out these few lines here, yeah, we don't need the derivatives anymore. Okay, so, got our original function just up here, we can get rid of these axes so we don't get confused. So, if we draw some nice big axes in the middle here. Right. So, let's add some features. So, we can add our asymptote like that. So, we just start it off because we don't know where it's going yet. And we think, okay, the first thing on the x-axis is the only x-intercept for this function. And that occurs at x equals 2. So, let's stick x equals 2 here. Okay. The next thing along the x-axis is the only turning point in our system, which is at x equals 4. So we go to x equals 4, and we can say, OK, the function is definitely crossing the, in the axis here. At x equals 4, we know we've got a turning point. OK, x equals 4, and it's above the axis at 1 8th. So the turning point, we've got a gradient equal to 0, and it's at 1 over 8 here. Right, And then the last point we want to add is that we've got an inflection point at x equals 6, which just means that our rate of change of our gradient has gone to 0 as a point. Right? So if we think about trying to extend these lines here, what's happening far off to the left-hand side, far off as x goes very negative? Well, when x gets very negative, this top line will go to a negative number and the bottom line, negative, divided, negative squared, is going to be a positive. So the bottom line's a positive. So it means this thing's just going to stay 
negative. It's never going to cross the axis, as we'd expect, so it's going to do something like that. OK, so our function must come up here, go through the axis here, come to the turning point, and stop. And what's going to happen next? So as x gets very large, so when x is a big number, a very large number minus 2 is going to be positive. OK? And a very large positive number squared is going to still be positive. So we get positive over positive, which equals positive. So this thing, as we'd expect, has no more x-axis intercepts. So it's just going to stay positive forever. But it's going to get very, very small because it's eventually going to tend to look like the function uh, 1 over x because we're going to have the top line uh, becoming increasingly like y equals x and the bottom line becoming increasingly like y equals x squared, so we get x divided by x squared, 1 over x. Okay, so this thing's going to be asymptotic to our x-axis, so it's going to be down here like this. Okay, and what's going to happen, as we said, we go up to this turning point, and we go down, and the gradient's decreasing, 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 and it comes to a point above 6, where it's no longer decreasing anymore, and it's coming up like this all the way out here. Okay? And that is what our function x minus 2 over x squared would look like. The last two pieces of information we're going to extract are the domain and the range. So the domain is which places on the x-axis have a valid and corresponding uh, y coordinate. So our domain for this function, our function exists everywhere except where uh, x equals 0, okay? And we can write that in the following way, so we can say that uh, there, are, there are several ways that we could write this, but the way I want you to learn to do it is it can exist, the domain is between minus infinity to 0, and by putting a round bracket, we're saying not including 0. Uh, and here we go, it goes to the union with, so as well as, or and, including 0 up to plus infinity. Okay? All those x coordinates are allowed, but not 0, which is why we've got this round bracket. For the range, for the range, we are going to have, we can have all the way down to negative infinity, no problem. So when x gets very, very close to zero, uh, very, very close to zero, this is going to get an extremely large y value, uh, but negative, extremely large negative y value. So we can go from minus infinity all the way up to what is the highest y coordinate we get? One eighth. So we get one eighth here, and because we include the point one eighth, we use a square bracket like this. OK, so I hope that was a useful refresher on how to do curve sketching. Uh, there are many other aspects that we can analyze from this curve, but uh, we'll go through those in more detail in the actual lecture. Uh, and I'll see you there. Cheers.